1997 Presidential Apology for the United States Public Health Service Syphilis Study at Tuskegee. We are also celebrating the 1999 opening of the National Center for Bioethics and Research in Healthcare. I always start by inviting chairman of the Macon County Commission, Lewis Maxwell, to welcome the attendees. You know, you can't get to Tuskegee University without coming through the city of Tuskegee. And you can't get to the city of Tuskegee without coming through Macon County. So we always want to start with allowing our commissioner, our chair, to welcome you to this wonderful event. Chairman Maxwell. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Dr. Warren. Oh, yes, sir. And each and every one of you. I am indeed honored to, uh, to be invited to be a part of this activity. Dr. Warren, you, you are so special for our community and I just wanna thank you for reminding people how to, how to get to Tuskegee University. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> in terms of our connection to each other. But I want to say to, uh, to you, Dr. Warren, and your staff and all of the participants here, uh, first of all, welcome. I wish I could welcome you all individually, and I'm looking forward to a better day so that we can get together physically again. But uh, uh, through the mechanism we have, we want to welcome each one of you uh, on behalf of the Bacon County government, and, but most of all, on behalf of the great citizens of this county, Macon County, we, Dr. Warren, you know, and to University of Tuskegee University, we stand ready to support you all in any way we can, especially in times like this. We appreciate you even more. We appreciate the bioethics uh, uh, and the service that you do even more because God has brought alive in terms of what we need in our community, not just here in Tuskegee, but in the world, because you represent uh, uh, our people all over the world as, we, as it relates in terms of the ethics portion of where we're going to. Being in a pandemic, uh, your role become even much more significant and we want to thank you for what you've done and what you will do because you know, uh, we need your leadership now more than ever as we deal with this pandemic and how we are to respond to the different, uh, uh, you know, we, we, we about to be excited about the possibility of the vaccine, but yet we know the vaccine is one thing. We still need you all to help us, to encourage us, to promote us, because the vaccine is no good unless we unless we get it into our, you know, that we, that we use it. So we, we appreciate what you're going to do and what you have done to enlighten us, to encourage us, uh, to give us confidence that we have eyes out there that uh, are watching for us, and we appreciate you all so much. So I'm beginning of, of uh, all the citizen and leadership of this county, we thank you. Please know that whatever we can do to support Tuskegee University, the bioethic, all you have to do is call. Well, so Commissioner, thank you so much. You have been a guiding light for, for our work. And every time I ask for something, you give me more than I've ever asked for. So I am, um, I'm home in Tuskegee and I'm home in Macon County and I can't think Tuskegee without thinking Macon County. And I promise you, we always think about the county as we move forward. So again, I appreciate your time, your commitment, your leadership. It's just a pleasure knowing and working with you. And God bless. God bless you, my brother. Yes, I will sir. have to leave you all, but I please know that I'm, I'm, I'm not leaving, just leaving you right now, but I, I'm always here for you, okay? Yes, sir. Thank you so much. God bless you, my brother. God Absolutely. Bless you. We also want to welcome our colleagues from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention for their support, their guidance, their leadership, and their involvement. Over the last 10 years, particularly, we have been blessed to go beyond institutional relationships to personal relationships. We have a partnership that is both ethical and heartwarming. Dr. Bolin, the head of the Division of STD Prevention at CDC, has provided unusual support and guidance. And of course, Ms. Joe Valentine, our project officer, 
has helped us negotiate not only through CDC, but through WHHS and other places where we need to engage and understand how to work much better together. So I'm pleased that we've got a true example of government and university partnerships. Well, you've, you've read the overall theme for this year's activity, ethics and vulnerability, the United States Constitution. What a fitting topic for a fitting time. In times such as these, we were supposed to meet earlier this year, but due to the coronavirus crisis, we postponed, not canceled, our commemoration events. What a fitting theme given the recent election of President-elect Joseph Biden and Vice President-elect Kamala Harris. You know, I've never heard more national chatter about HBCUs and the Divine Nine. The nation is waking up to what African Americans have known since 1837 and the founding of Cheney State University in Pennsylvania and the first which was the first historically black university, or hearing about the Divine Nine and Alpha Phi Alpha fraternity, the first black fraternity founded in 1906. The theme alludes to the importance of building relationships, trustworthy relationships, trustworthiness and trust between vulnerable and susceptible populations and federal state and local governments. We've got to prove ourselves trustworthy in order to be trusted. In the midst of the commemoration events, the coronavirus pandemic is threatening the health of persons around the world. What is clear as the evolving science unfolds, ethics considerations necessitate a balance between what is known and what to do. In the midst of uncertainty, we really are not clear about what we know or what we do. A cost-benefit analysis must focus on the needs and desires of those populations who have historically suffered adverse health outcomes and how to allocate resources fairly. Not only are historical instances well-documented, but current events worsen the problem. These same populations are currently at great risk of morbidity and mortality from the coronavirus. They should be among the first to receive a vaccination when a safe vaccine is available. There's a difference between the vaccine and a vaccination. And the vaccine is grounded in science. And in my view, the vaccination protocols and processes are grounded in ethics. Developing a safe vaccine will occur and everyone should have ready access to vaccinations. The conversation about should we or shouldn't we is not the right conversation or the right question. Vaccine clinical trials are essential and diverse populations must be included in clinical trials for the vaccine to prove efficacious for everybody. However, safe vaccination development, safe vaccine development and vaccination compliance are separate issues, but they overlap, they overlap. Valid and reliable science will surely produce a safe vaccine. We heard good news today about Pfizer and their development of safe vaccines. Vaccination compliance, however, depends on trustworthy relationships between the research community and the public. The ethical question is, what assurances are needed for vulnerable populations to fully participate in vaccine clinical trials? And what strategies are required to enhance equitable access to fair vaccination process? protocols. As we begin these series of events virtually, we must pause, I think, to celebrate the life of a dear friend, Dr. Bayless Walker. 
PhD, MPH, who transitioned April 9th, 2020. Dr. Walker is my friend for more than 40 years. And you know, I speak of him in the presence because as long as we call his name, he lives. Dr. Walker, Dr. Walker served the nation in many, many ways over many, many years. He served as the Commissioner of Public Health for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, Chairman of the Massachusetts Public Health Council. He served as State Director of Public Health for Michigan, Director of the Occupational Health Standards Division, Occupational Safety and Health Administration, U.S. Department of Labor. He was President of the American Public Health Association, fellow in the Royal Society of Health in London, England, fellow in the American College of Epidemiology. And he was an NIH advisor on environmental and community health aspects of biodefense bio research. His academic accomplishments include professor of environmental and occupational medicine and toxicology, Howard College of Medicine, professor of environmental health, School of Public Health, State University of New York in Albany, and Dean of the Public Health Faculty, University of Oklahoma Health Sciences Center. Dr. Dr. Walker served on the advisory committee of almost all of the HBCU accredited MPH programs. He revised the initial proposal for the MPH program here at Tuskegee University and served as, a, as chair of their external advisory committee for the graduate public health program in the College of Veterinary Medicine here at Tuskegee. He was also, by the way, a visiting bioethics scholar at the National Center for Bioethics in Research and Healthcare. Dr. Walker's legacy will live in the hearts and minds of many from a, for a long, long time. The honor of the commemoration events, the National Center for Bioethics has virtual activities spanning the entire week. We're doing this the whole week. Beginning Monday, November 9th, the Voices for Our Fathers Legacy Foundation, the descendant family members, hosted a virtual healing session as they do every year, facilitated by doctors Ed and Ann Wimberly. I participated in most of the sessions yesterday and Dr. Ann asked each of us to share our jitters and our joys. It was an opportunity for us to exhale and to share our jitters, our joys, our fears, and our hopes. Take a moment, if you will, and reflect on your jitters and your joys. You know, we didn't have to be here today. Through the grace of God, we stand here, we stand strong. Today, November 10th, the annual Public Health Ethics Intensive Course hosts scholars from across the country and in fact, across the world to rigorously examine salient bioethics and public health ethics issues that impact not only the nation, but the world. We appreciate your support. We invite your full participation and we look forward to an exciting week. And now let us open our session with a very powerful beginning. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. And we see that many of you are signing on now, um, and so we appreciate your presence, we appreciate your support uh, for the National Center for Bioethics in Research and Healthcare. We are moving along we, a little um, a little early. We have, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> we have um, um, a robust um, sister, uh, set of activities or presentations today. Um, today, after, uh, in a few moments, we will introduce to you our wonderful students from the National for Center of Bioethics 
um, the Bioethics Honors Program. She graduated last year and she will present to you the speakers for today, which is famed and honored and revered attorney, um, Fred Gray, our own Dr. Ruben C. Warren, the leader and director at the National Center's Center for Bioethics and in, um, health, in research and healthcare. And then later on this afternoon, after we've had um, two hours of conversation and responses, and we encourage each of you to participate, we will have Dr. Riggins Earl, who is a professor of theology and ethics and philosophy at the International Interdenominational Theological Center at, um, in Atlanta, Georgia. And we will say more about him at this time, at that time. And then we have our own Dr. Charm, Theono Charm. Excuse me, one of our, <laughs> he, uh, he, he uh, was supposed to present with us last year, but there was a conflict. And as a matter of fact, he was kind of pinch hitting for some one of our professors who took ill and there was a conflict, but so we had to get him back this year. So we're absolutely excited to have him. So. That, that is our agenda for today. Tomorrow, we will have, we'll begin at, at uh, one o'clock, um, that is Central Standard Time, and we will have um, attorney, an attorney from, from, she's a federal attorney in the Southern District, that is attorney Monica Beamer, and then she will be presented, she will present, um, uh, and, uh, the, uh, one of her classmates at Georgetown University, attorney and professor Charlene Bryant will be presenting tomorrow um, afternoon as our first speakers. And then we will have attorney Natasha McCrary who presented with us before and historian Sawande Mustakeen. If you, you have to hear them, these scholars are so um, energetic and brilliant and thoughtful that you just got to be a part of this. So they will be presenting first tomorrow. Then you have, then tomorrow at 410, we have Dr. Randall Bailey, who formed the Interdenominational Theological Center in Atlanta. And that's the second time I mentioned that school. That's the, the largest Black theological seminary in the world. And it is a school that has produced many people, many great thinkers, including our own Dr. Ruben Warren, um, who obtained his Masters in the Divinity, Master of Divinity from there. And I was a guest lecturer for a year at the, at the ITC. So Dr. Randall Bailey, who is a, who is a um, uh, Hebrew Bible scholar, that is an Old Testament scholar, he will be presenting the, he will be presenting uh, tomorrow, and then I will be the respondent for Dr. Bailey. So I look, I look forward for an, an exciting, engaging moment. That is, <laughs> Dr. Bailey he always brings to us a very transparent view of the world. So we have deep appreciation for what he's going to say, right, Dr. Warren? He even if he hasn't said it yet. <laughs> So we, we appreciate, I think you're silent, we appreciate. Um, and then, ladies and gentlemen, and then, ladies and gentlemen, um, the following day, um, sorry, that later on that day, we have who Dr. Warren just referred to, spoke about, um, Dr. Gail Bolin, who will be talking about, about ethics and vulnerability, specifically women and children. And so he will he, um, Dr. Bolin and Heather O'Hara Rand, who's another MD and Bachelor of Science of Public Health, they will be presenting on Thursday. And then we close it out with one of my favorite um, bioethic and public health scholars, um, Dennis Cooley, a brother who we met several years ago from the University of North Dakota and who served with us, actually invited us, Dr. Warren and myself, to, um, to Rome, where we presented uh, at, at his side. And we had a, we had a glorious time in Rome presenting. Because one of the things 
uh, I'm going to try to say what Dr. Warren says, it. Dr. Warren, please correct me if I get it wrong, but one of the charges that we have is not just to bring the world to Tuskegee, but to take Tuskegee to the world. I mean, did I say that? Right? right. You got it just right. <laughs> we, we, got, we got to take Tuskegee University to the world because the, 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 the 623 men in the study, the so-called study, I'll be clear about that, the United States Public Health Service um, so-called study of syphilis um, in Tuskegee or in Macon County, those men, ladies and gentlemen, and my brothers and sisters, those men, we want to make sure that their living and their dying was not in vain. So the work we do in public health ethics and bioethics, and to put a cap on ethical violations of our people and other people, black and brown people and other people around the world, because if you help one, you help the other, we are our brothers and sisters keepers. The work that we do around the world, we do it not for ourselves, because I'm telling you, we can do other things elsewhere, but we are signed here to do it, to make the lives better for others. And so, the last person I want to mention after who will be presenting after with Dr. Cooley is a dear sister whom I met when I was presenting at Emory last year, Dr. Nicole Phillips. And I told her she is a, a philosophy of religion and philosophy of religion and sociology combined. So you could imagine, given this time where we are in history, that is just, <laughs> the whole presentation has got to be amazing. So the persons we have, ladies and gentlemen, are absolutely uh, powerful. So we appreciate your presence, and we hope that you, be, you attend as many of these sessions, if not all of these sessions, that you can. Once again, what's the, what's the, so let me give you the format. So after the presenter presents, then um, we will introduce the respondent, and the respondent will respond to the presenter and come in his or her own way. And after that part is finished, um, then we will have our um, question and answer period. During that period, we want you to write down, number one, there's two ways you can do it, write down some thoughtful questions, or you could type them in, and then when you're ready, you can type them into the Q&A, and then we will address as many questions as you can. You know, Dr. Warren is interesting. This is a <laughs> this is a more uh, democratic format, right? <laughs> because you, we have to take the mic to people as people waving their hands, and they may not be they may not get uh, get the hold of their mic. But this time, we, we you you just put your question in there. <laughs> you, you can toss it in anytime you want, and we are going to um, do our best to respond. And um, so that's how we will perform. If you want, there's a way you could you can ask your question online, or you could ask your question um, in the um, in the uh, in the question answer. I want to make one more note, and this is important because just in case some of you um, do not want to be for whatever reason recorded, <laughs> you know, sometimes sometimes people don't want to be recorded. They might be running, you know. <laughs> <laughs> they might be have to be hiding from something. That's okay. If you don't, we have to let you know up front that this is number one is being recorded, and number two, it will be published on YouTube and Facebook. So as you see, Mr. Davis is on at all times. He's he's managing that system so that when this is finished, you can put it up on YouTube and Facebook. It'll be on our website. The like link will be on our website because we want to give you an opportunity because so much information is shared. We want to make sure you have an opportunity to take good use of it. But most and most importantly, we want to make sure that those of you who are professors, those of you who are teachers and instructors can take it to the classroom. This is an invaluable tool to take to your classroom to give an assignment, especially on Blackboard or online classes, so that your students can get the richness and the fullness of this kind of conversation. This doesn't happen every day. All right, so now we are at that time. Is Sierra on, online? Mr. Davis, is Sierra sign on yet? Yes, um, I just made her a panelist so that we should be able to uh, see and, and hear her. Okay, good. Well, I am now going to introduce to you Sierra Siler. I need Sorry. to... 
Wait, wait, let me read. Let me read her bio because this is a very important, ladies and gentlemen. Sierra Siler, I, I I teased her all the time because she is somebody had me on twice. I'm hearing a feedback. Okay, yeah, that's better. Um, Sierra got, um, graduated, um, and she didn't get the, the the total Tuskegee graduation effect because of COVID, and we had to you know shut down the constrain the, the, the graduation, but she, Sierra has taught me how to be more open. We had used to have these long conversations and she's just a brilliant mind because I thought that her mind was so expansive. She's a visual arts, she was a visual arts major at Tuskegee University from, she's from um, Cleveland, Ohio. And she, she graduated in, in, she graduated to pursue a, a degree in graphic art and design. Um, in 2017, she graduated from Cleveland School of the Arts of Science, of, of the Arts as a dance major, as well as a high tech academy, as high tech academy, a selective dual enrollment program. Her participation in this program resulted in her graduation from, from Tuskegee, early graduate from Tuskegee University. She has many diverse interests, including language, writing, dance, and visual arts. She has taken French. Latin, oh my God, Greek and Spanish and continues to independently study Spanish. You sound like Kobe. <laughs> Kobe had that kind of mind. During the four years she studied Latin, she won several awards in the national Latin exams and national etym etymology exam. As a Latin and Greek student, she traveled to Greece in 2014, where she learned more about the languages, history, and culture. Sierra has also studied various dance genres, including liturgical, ballet, modern jazz, and contemporary for 12 years. As a self-taught artist, Sierra incorporates her Afrocentric aesthetic into illustrations and semi-realistic graphic drawings. Graphite drawings. She is learning to use acrylic paint, illustration, and Photoshop to apply to her art, print, business, and graphic art and design career. Ladies and gentlemen, now I must say this as well. Um, um, last year, I, I gave a talk at Case Western Reserve University and in Cleveland, and Sierra was there with her mother and father. It was just a tremendous honor to be to, to present in the, among strangers and look out and see family and friends. She is one of our Bharatis Honors inductees, so she's extremely special to us. All the stuff that you just heard about her, I'm so sorry to tell you, that's just who the Bharatis Honors students are. She just, <laughs> just like that. So, so I present to you now, a wonderful student. She, again, she's graduated, Miss Sierra Siler, and she will introduce to you attorney Fred Gray. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for that amazing introduction, Dr. Hodge. Um, I'm introducing attorney Fred Gray. Attorney Fred Gray Sr. produced on December 14th, 1930 in Montgomery, Alabama. Fred Gray studied at law Reserve before defending both Claudette Colvin and Rosa Parks in the search to desegregate his house city's bus lines after becoming a crucial figure in African American voting rights and school integration. He also filed suit from the authorities for the guys used by the Tuskegee syphilis study. His dad died when he was a toddler and his mom sent the youthful Gray to school early. Um, this is where he attended Alabama State College and he graduated in 1951 and pursued his law degree later at Case Western Reserve. Gray made a promise to himself that he would work diligently to end racial segregation in his home upon becoming an attorney. Uh, an attorney, I'm sorry. Park's case sparked the Montgomery bus boycott, which continued over a year and led to the desegregation of bus lines. Gray married Bernice Hill in 1956, as well as the, and the couple later went to have four kids. Gray managed several important crucial cases in the civil rights movement in the 1960s, including Go Million versus Lightfoot. He claimed before the Supreme Court and the, un the un unconstitutionality of the Tuskegee-based rezoning laws created by local officials that would leave African-Americans out of elections. In another Supreme Court case, Gray was diligent in his attempts to get the NAACP have the ability to form in Alabama after the group was outlawed in the state. 
Gray was also instrumental in leading cases and filing suits that resulted in the desegregation of public institutions of higher learning, um, combined with development of an order request, requesting the integration of elementary and secondary schools. Gray was an instrumental figure in another historical case, which was the Tuskegee syphilis study, as I mentioned earlier. Um, here, he, the guys were told they were not given proper medical treatment and were left untreated with a syphilis disease for many decades. Gray filed suit on the men's benefit receiving vast amounts in 1975, um, resulting in appropriate attention for his remaining customers. Um, later, President Bill Clinton offered an apology on the government's benefit in 1997 and an acknowledgement of what had occurred. Along with his legal profession, Gray had also served as a preacher in the Newton Church of Christ for around a decade along beginning in 1957. He was nominated to be a federal judge by President Jimmy Carter, Carter in 1979, but he removed his name following a conservative backlash. He's since received a variety of accolades and became the president of the National Bar Association in 1985 after becoming the very first African-American of the Alabama Bar Association in 2002. In 1995, he also released his autobiography, Bus Ride to Justice, The Life and Works of Fred Gray. So it's my honor to introduce attorney Fred Gray. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, can you hear me? Can yes. You? Sir. yes, sir. You can hear me now? Yes, sir. Okay, I just, just want to be sure. I'm, I'm not uh, familiar with how to operate all this electronic material, but I uh, would like to, well, I thank Ms. Silla for the introduction. Uh, they tell me that introduction sometimes is like lending it. It's good to rub on, but not to take in. <laughs> but in any event, I uh, am appreciative to her. And it's always good to see young people who are interested in growing and in developing. Let me express my genuine appreciation uh, to Dr. Warren, the director of the Tuskegee University Center for Bioethics and Research in Healthcare. I want to thank him for uh, inviting me to participate in this program. Uh, the 23rd year, the commemoration of the 1997 presidential apology that, that uh, President Clinton made to the participants in the study, to the community, and on behalf of the whole nation. So I am delightful that you have asked me to come and be a part of this study, a part of your program. The university has invited me to participate, I think, in most of the programs that they've had, and I'm certainly appreciative for it. The apology that we are talking about, and I have been asked to speak on the role of lawyers for the plaintiff in Charlie B. Pollard versus United States of America. That is the caption of a case that I filed in 1973 in the United States District Court for the Middle District of Alabama on behalf of some 623 men who were originally involved in what has become known as the Tuskegee Sisters Study. These persons initially were divided into two categories. Some had syphilis, some did not have syphilis. So 
my role in representing the persons in the Pollard case is the same role that I have played in representing many persons that I've had the privilege of representing during these now 66 years of law practice. That's a long time to do anything. But for you to understand my role in it, you have to understand a little bit and the role in this case and the Pollock case is no different than the role in any of these other cases. This case happened to have been one of those cases that has gotten national and international attention. Most of the cases that I tried during these 66 years were not that way. Nobody for the most part heard about them. Nobody read about them. Nobody had seminars for them. They were simply people who had problems that needed to be solved. And they found a lawyer who they had enough confidence in in order to do that. So you have to understand then that my role here is no different than the role that I played in many other civil rights cases, beginning with those involved originally out of the Montgomery bus boycott, who will be celebrating their anniversary uh, next month. But it has, but the reason I became involved in the first place, and I was born in Montgomery on the west side of Montgomery where nothing good supposed to come. Uh, I was born in a shotgun house. My father died when I was two. I was the youngest of five children. And my mother told us, even though I don't remember my father, she told the five of us that we could be anything we wanted to be if we did three things. One, keep Christ first in your life. Two, stay in school and get a good education. And three, stay out of trouble. I tried to do the same thing and tried to instill those basic principles in my, five, my four children and in our grandchildren. But as I grew up, everything was completely segregated in Alabama. And I found out early on that I was basically on the two things that a young boy, African-American in Montgomery, Alabama in the thirties and forties could look forward to professionally. And that was a, either be a preacher or a teacher. So I decided I'd be both. After going to one of our church schools up in Nashville and coming back to Montgomery, I uh, learned a little something about preaching and I was going to then learn how to be a teacher. So I was going to go to Alabama State. Alabama State was on the east side of town. I lived on the west side of town. I had to use the transportation, public transportation system as a means of transporting. And as I used that public transportation system, I realized that African-Americans in Montgomery between December of 1947 and May of 1951 were being mistreated and particularly so on the buses. To make a long story short, I made a personal commitment that I found out that lawyers are supposed to help people solve problems. And I thought that African-Americans in Montgomery had problems on the buses and I realized that everything was completely segregated. And I made a commitment that I was gonna finish Alabama State, go to somebody's law school, 
not even apply to the University of Alabama because I knew they wouldn't accept me because of my race. Finished law school, come back to Alabama, take the bar exam, pass the bar exam, and destroy everything segregated I could find. I was fortunate enough to finish Alabama State in May of 51 to enroll in what was then Western Reserve University, now Case Western in Cleveland in September of 51, finished in June of 54, took the Ohio bar in July of, in June of 54, the Alabama ball in July of 54, and told in August of 54, I passed both. And on September the 7th, I started the practice of law. The best thing about it is I didn't tell people that I was interested in doing civil rights work because if I had, it wouldn't have helped. With that background then, my representing the men in the Tuskegee syphilis study was no different than representing Claudette Carvin and Mrs. Parks and Dr. King and John Lewis and the students at Alabama State who were arrested and the people in Tuskegee and the Gomillion B. Lightfoot case when they were uh, when we began to get a few registered to vote, were put out of the city. It was to help destroy everything I could find. So then I was delighted to have been instrumental in being one of the persons who encouraged the president to make an apology on May the 16th, 1997 in the East Room of the White House. And as I sat on the front row to the right and listened and saw what took place, as I listened to President Clinton make an apology, he even mentioned Fred Gray and mentioned a little role that I played in it. After the president had talked about and expressed appreciation to the Surgeon General Satcher for his role, and after recognizing some members of Congress for their role, he then looked over to the right side at me and said, a great friend of freedom Fred Gray, thank you for fighting this long battle all these years. It has now been 48 years since Mr. Charlie Pollard came into my office on July 27th, 1972 to talk with me about representing him and what has become known as the Tuskegee Sisters study. As we sat there in the East Room on that date, I went back and thought about how I became involved in the study. How Charlie Pollard became involved in it. And those of you who are participating in this program now, most of you know very little about it except what you have read about. And now we have many people who are experts in the field and I don't profess to be an expert. But when Charlie Pollard walked into my office in Tuskegee on the 27th of July in 1972, which was shortly after, a few days after I had read, as I was on a plane coming from Washington, D.C. to Atlanta and then on to Montgomery, about these men 
from Macon County, Alabama, who had been involved in the Tuskegee syphilis, what they were calling the Tuskegee syphilis study. I'd never heard about it. And in 1972, I had been living in Tuskegee since 1964, 65. I had been representing people in Tuskegee since 1956 and 57. Never heard about it. And I said, how can I, a lawyer, being involved in civil rights activities and never heard of it. But when I read about it, I was shocked. Then when I got home and a couple of days later, Mr. Pollard came into my office and he had with him in his hand, a copy of a newspaper from the Montgomery Advertiser. And he says, lawyer, and I had done a little uh, property transaction for Mr. Pollard who lived in Nova Sober. He says, lawyer, I don't know whether you read about this story in the Montgomery Advertiser, but he said, I'm one of the men in that study. And I now understand what I did not understand those 25 years before. And he said, I think my government has taken advantage of me and the other men in the study. And he says, lawyer, do you think you can do something to help me? I said, Mr. Pollard, I think I can. That was the beginning. That's how I became involved. Those men were not thinking about being guinea pigs in a study. What he was concerned about when he came to me was to see if I couldn't get some money from the federal government to compensate him and these other men who had worked with him in the study. Little did I know, and this came at a very important time in my life because I was quite busy. Because I had just been elected two years earlier to the Alabama legislature and one of the first two blacks in the Alabama legislature. I had pending lawsuits that had been filed against the University of Alabama, Auburn University. Uh, 90 of the uh, 105 of the 119 public school systems and a lot of just bread and butter cases. And then this case came up and my wife who died before the apology and who had worked so hard with me and we had four small children all the school age. And she didn't think I was spending as much time as I should have been spending to this, this Tuskegee syphilis study. She said, great, this is probably the most important case you've ever had. And some of these other things, and you know, it's good to be in the legislature, but it's just so much you can do. But to make a long story short, she convinced me that I needed to spend more time to this case. Now this case was not an easy case to win. Number one, anytime you have a lawsuit and our investigation disclosed that the federal government was the one really responsible for all of it. If the federal government had not agreed to finance the program, it would never have existed. It was their financing and their encouragement that caused it to do. And when we found out that one, only African-Americans were involved in it, two, 
they told them that they were treating them for whatever was wrong with them. They never disclosed to them that they uh, had syphilis or anything else but gave them the impression that they were being treated for whatever they were, uh, whatever their ailment was. So we concluded, and as I asked Mr. Pollard to go and contact all the other men that he knew who was in the study so we could interview them, we began to find out what has taken place. And when you sue the federal government, you can only sue them on the grounds that they permit you to sue them on. So you had to strictly comply with the Federal Torts Claims Act and other acts that we had to do. And that lawsuit had to be filed within one year from the time that you discovered it. And we discovered it in July of 72 which meant that I had to have a lawsuit filed in a federal court within a year. And I found out that there were some 600 and some of these men, some of them were living, some of them were dead. How are you gonna file a lawsuit on behalf of a dead person? I know you have to end up having a personal representative appointed. So it means having appointments made. But then it takes money in order to finance a lawsuit. And Fred Gray didn't have any money. So I went to the organizations that I had been going to before in order to get help in this case. When I was given the responsibility of doing the work for the people in the Montgomery Boss Boycott, I went to Thurgood Marshall, called him on the phone. He was then general counsel for the NAACP, told him who I was and what was going on in Montgomery, which he had read about. And I told him they have asked me to do the legal work for him and I want to do it, but I don't know what to do. I need some help. May I come to New York and see you and talk with you or your associate. And will you all be able to help me and the 40,000 African-Americans in Montgomery who are now staying off of the buses until they can go back on an integrated basis? He says, come on up to New York and we'll talk with you. I went to New York, I talked with him he introduced me to Robert Carter, who was his chief assistant then, who later became general counsel for the NACP, and who later became a federal district judge in Manhattan. Then I asked, as time passed, at this time, Jack Greenberg was then director counsel of the NACP. And I went to them because they had been helping me with these other cases, these school desegregation cases, and I needed some help. And he said, well, Fred, this is potentially a fee generating case and we can't do that under existing law. But he says, I will recommend you to someone who can. He recommended me to the Dean of the Columbia Law School at Loma University which was his law school alma mater, who introduced me to one of his law professors who worked with me. I tried to get lawyers all over the country to work with me on this case and we would share a fee, but I couldn't get any, so I had to piecemeal it. One, these lawyers say, well, what we will do, we won't be counsel of record but we will help you draft a complaint. We'll help you do your research. And I knew once I filed a lawsuit in Juris Johnson's court, that what he was going to do was immediately put it on a fast track and I was gonna need some help to do it. I'd been able to do that. How am I gonna finance the money that it's gonna take in order to do the discovery that's needed to get a case ready for trial? 
I couldn't find anybody. I went to the bank, Alan Parker at the Alabama Exchange Bank. I knew him, was doing work for the bank. He let me do work for him. And I told him what my problem was. And he was one person in this community, a white person who had the respect of both sides of the fence and who was helped us tremendously in desegregating things in this city, in this county, and really across the nation, and in the Tuskegee Syphilis study. He says, well, lawyer, let me tell you off, off, off right up front. The bank is in the business of lending money, but we have to be paid back. We can't help you on a contingent fee basis. You're gonna to have to pay us back whether you win, lose, or draw. I said, I understand that. But he said, what I can do, I can lend it to you. And then when you find out, I can set up a payment plan where you won't have to start paying it back until you know either you will get some money or you won't, but you're gonna to have to pay the bank back. With those components in place, I am now ready to file the lawsuit. And I'll forever be grateful to Alan Parker and for the Alabama Exchange Bank for what they did. But in representing these men, and you have to understand that people now talk to me all the time and want me to do this and want me to do that and want me to do so and so for these people. I have to remind them who I represent. And I have to remind them that these people who got me to represent it was basically concerned about two things. Now we all may be concerned about a whole lot of things now, but they wanted some money if they could get it. And while the government had a health care program and a burial program that they were voluntarily giving, they wanted that to be a part of any conclusion so that those men would still get those benefits, but not on a voluntary basis, and that they would be compensated. And that was fine. We were able finally, after two years, after four years, we ended up finally settling the lawsuit. At the beginning, nobody wanted to acknowledge the fact that they were a relative with these men who had syphilis, because syphilis is not, it was considered a dreaded disease. Nobody came forward during those three years to help Fred Gray find some money and sign on the line to pay it back, whether I got any or not. Nobody was concerned about that. But you know, once we got a settlement, at first we couldn't find any relatives. Then we had too many relatives because everybody was claiming it because they wanted some money. So now we go from people who are not wanting anything to everybody who wants something and they want the law to do what's what. But in the middle of all of this, something else took place that's very important and then I'm gonna stop. And that is uh, in 1972, I was invited to New York in February to do a Black History Month program. And I was glad to go up and while up there, Claudette Carvin, who was a young lady that really gave us the impetus to do and to have the Montgomery bus boycott, was living in New York and I knew that. And I contacted her and she came up to where I was speaking. And during the time I was in New York, there was a movie on TV, Miss Elvis Boys. And this Ms. Elvis boy is supposed to have depicted what happened to these men in the Tuskegee Sisters study. I saw that while I was there and guess what? I didn't recognize it because they had them dancing in nightclubs and doing a lot of other things that I didn't quite understand. But these men that I knew 
why most of them were not educated. They were farmers, they were hard workers, but they were outstanding people in their community. And when I saw that, I immediately that night, when I got to seeing it on television, I called my office. That was when Joanne was my secretary. She's dead now. I told him about what was what. I said, what I want you to do is to contact our clients in the Tuskegee syphilis study, set up an appointment for them to come to my office because I want to talk to them let them know and let's get a copy of Ms. Elvis Boy so they can see it, so they can tell me whether or not this is the, uh, or whether this correctly depicts what they had not told me it depicted. They did it. And to make a long story short, they said, lawyer, that is not the way it happens. It didn't happen that way. He said, we've told you how it happened. But I also found out then that there were some people who had been interested in getting an apology from the president of the United States. These men in the study didn't know anything about an apology or how to get one. Their lawyer didn't know anything about how to get one. Nobody said anything to me about it, but it was being done. And the first I heard it was, I get a phone call from a reporter and the reporter talked to me about it as if I knew that someone was trying to get an apology form. And you know what I said? I said, I didn't know about it. I didn't tell them, I didn't know. I said to myself, I didn't know about it, but it's a good idea and it needs to be done. And if anybody can help to do it, these men can do it. I told those men about Ms. Elvis boys. They saw Ms. Elvis boys and they said, well, lawyer. And I told them that there was a group out that was working on an apology. And I think we ought to join that group. And we sat and made a plan where those men would have a press conference at Shallow Missionary Baptist Church on April the 8th, 1997. They would invite, we would invite the press and see. I talked to some media of the press about it and they said, well, you probably get a few people, but you won't get many. We sent out a little press release and asked them uh, uh, about attending a press conference. And less than 24 hours from the time we sent it, we got notices back where there was a lot of media interested in such a press conference. We had the press conference at Shiloh Missionary Baptist Church and it was the leading story in the news all over the country because those men had talked about and explained to the nation. And I ended up the next day receiving a phone call from the White House from one of the chief assistants to the president of the United States. He told me who he was. He told me that next day that the president is gonna make that apology. I said, well, thank you. I appreciate you telling me that. I said, but I want you to and that man who contacted me and who was a contact man in the White House, his name Ben Johnson, he still lives up in DC, talked with him a couple of weeks ago. I said, well, don't make the mistake that other people have made. Be sure that these people become involved in the apology. 
he promised me that that would take place. And do you know what? That is exactly what happened. He kept me abreast what was going on. He told me what needed to be done. We followed his instructions. The apology took place. And not only did the president apologize on behalf of the nation, but he was able to apologize to the community, to the university and to all. And there were several, as you know, of those participants who were living at that time who attended that conference in the White House. Charles, Charlie Pollard, the lead plaintiff, Herman Shaw, who became the spokesman, and who told them at the time and told the president that they had just formed the Tuskegee Human and Civil Rights Multicultural Center, which is a nonprofit corporation in Tuskegee. And the men said, we want a center there where our people can go and see. And as Mr. Shaw said, when he was talking before he introduced the president, he says, you go down and you see a sign saying uh, something important has happened over there. He said, we want the nation to know that. I promise those men, in addition to getting the little money that I was able to get for them, that if life lies, we would establish such a museum for them. And as you know, it exists. And a lot of people have worked and the university has helped us and a lot of you have helped. But that's what the men wanted. And I'm glad that we were able to help get that done. But as I look back over all these years, a lot of people have made and I've gotten a lot of grants. I've been able to do a lot of things because of what these men did in the Tuskegee Sisters study. Two of the most important things I think that has happened has been, of course, Tuskegee University has the Bioethics Center. And it's wonderful. I think Dr. Payton did the right thing. He saw an opportunity where the university could take advantage of having been taken advantage of and get something good out of it. And then there's the thing that the men themselves want. And I have devoted the last 22 years of my life making speeches around the world, trying to raise money to keep that center open. While Mr. Uh, Shaw in his address asked the president to help and the president said he was, the president didn't realize he was talking about helping Tuskegee University. He wasn't talking about the Multicultural Center because he didn't know anything about it because it just had been formed. But the point is, we were able to get it done. It is now a museum that not only depicts and serves as a permanent memorial for those men, and you can go there and look under the chandelier and see the names of all 623 of those men. And you can look around the walls and you'll be able to see not only that, but you see the pictures of them. What they did, Sander did was took pictures of those men. They didn't care anything about who they were. They don't have the names on them, but they're there. So it now serves as a permanent memorial for the men in the study. It serves as a welcoming center for visitors for the city of Tuskegee and Macon County. And I was glad to see the chairman of the commission and that facility incidentally is owned by Macon County. They have tremendously helped. Without their help, it could never have been where it is. So then, as you celebrate here today, and as I go back to try to remember what I was supposed to talk about, the role lawyers 
for the plaintiff's played and Charlie Bess Bellis Pollard is stuff to be that we are happy to have run, represented those men, to have gotten what they wanted, to have been instrumental in helping others to do something. Because if the lawsuit had not been filed, this whole thing probably would have been pushed under the rug. If the lawsuit had not been filed, there wouldn't have been an apology because that apology was some 25 years later. So we are all in it together. We all need to work together. Just as I represented those men and represented these others, we have tremendous responsibilities. We have just engaged in one of the greatest and most impelling election in this country. And unless we realize that we still have some problems, and until we realize that these problems that we as African American have are minor, we can't be fighting and fussing among ourselves. We're gonna to have to work together. It was through working together that we were able to get an apology. It was through working together that we were able to have a successful litigation in that lawsuit. It is by working together that we were able to get, we hope a new president elected, uh, I mean, uh, inaugurated uh, in January. And the work that this, your organization is doing and the work that this community is doing is a work that we all need to do. And we need to remember that the struggle for equal justice continues. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Gray. That was that was really good. It's great to hear details and insight on these historical events that we learn about in school from someone who experienced them all firsthand. And it's very inspiring to hear your background. So thank you for that. Um, next, I'm going to introduce Dr. Warren. Um, Ruben Warren is currently the director of the National Center of Bioethics and Research and Healthcare and professor of bioethics at Tuskegee University in Tuskegee, Alabama. He also serves as the director and adjunct professor of the Institute for Faith Health Leadership and adjunct professor of public health medicine and ethics at the Interdenominational, Interdenominational Theological Center, ITC, in Atlanta, Georgia. And from 1988 to 1997, Dr. Warren served as the Associate Director for Minority Health at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC. And from 1997 to 2004, he was the Associate Director for Urban Affairs and Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry, the ATSDR. From 2005 to 2007, he served as part-time as the Director of Infrastructure Development for the National Center of Minority Health and health disparities at the National Institutes of Health in Bethesda, Maryland. And from 2004 to 2009, he was on leave for the National Center of Environmental Health in Atlanta, where he served as the Associate Director for Environmental Justice. Um, and as the Associate Director at the CDC, Dr. Warren also led an agency responsible for envir environmental justice and minority health. His extensive public health experience and community state local official and international levels range from clinical re and research work in Lag Lagos University teaching hospital in Lagos, Nigeria to heading the public health dentistry program at the Mississippi State Department of Health. Dr. Warren has contributed to the scientific literature and public health oral health health services research. His professional associations include the Health Brain Trust of the Congress Congressional Black Caucus in the United States, the National Health, the National Dental Association, the American Board of Dental Public Health, and the American Public Health Association, the United States Children's Front Fund, and the World Health Organization. And that is Dr. Uh, Ruben Warren. And right before he speaks, I do want to encourage everyone to put their questions in the Q and A box um, during the speeches. So thank you so much, Dr. Warren. Let us uh, thank Attorney Gray for an outstanding presentation. All right, we appreciate it. I could spend some time uh, reviewing what I heard and what I 
thought I heard, but that would not be the best use of, of my time. I want to spend a, a moment or two talking about an icon, a representative of what Black lawyers have done and continue to do and show the connection between what they do and what is so important in what we do. The role of Attorney Gray in the U.S. Public Health Service CIFLA study at Tuskegee is a prototype of the extraordinary work of Black lawyers and their leadership in civil and human rights. Attorney Gray's work includes, as you heard some of it, but the city of Montgomery versus Rosa Parks, state of Alabama versus Martin Luther King Jr., Rilio A. Broder versus W.A. Gale, Gamillion and Lightfoot, NAACP, and Alabama State Board of Education, William versus Wallace, William versus Michael, Edgar versus Lee Lee, Macon County Board of Education, Malone versus Dean's Administration, University of Alabama, Franklin versus William Parker, Dean of Graduate School, Auburn University, Pollard versus United States of America. I go through that to highlight the connection between, as Attorney Gray has said, the U.S. Public Health Service syphilis study and the Pollard versus United States of America and all the work that he does. So it's not viewed in a, in a vacuum. It's part of civil and human rights litigation. And that's what we have to remember. It's not in a vacuum. The last case, Pollard versus United States of America, is why we are here today. But don't disconnect that effort with the list of cases that I just mentioned. The original name of the Tuskegee study was the Tuskegee study of untreated syphilis in the Negro male in Macon County, Alabama. But when it came out in 1972, they called it the Tuskegee Syphilis Study. But let me tell you, the, the original name really said what that study was about. Untreated syphilis in the Negro male, which said they were not intending to ever treat those men, not only in Tuskegee, but in Macon County. And in fact, they developed a system that followed those men that we call a surveillance system wherever they went to be sure they wouldn't be treated even after penicillin was developed as an effective treatment. You see, they use the name Tuskegee because Tuskegee get, uh, gathers positive, empowering connotations because of the rich history of Tuskegee Institute, Booker T. Washington emphasized hygiene and all and other health preventive measures. George Washington Carver, I can go on and on and on in the interest of time I won't, but understand using the word Tuskegee to describe that horrendous study was inappropriate. And now we've corrected that, that misinformation. It was not by accident. Let me take a moment and just contextualize the framework of that horrendous episode. You can go back to 1619 and the Middle Passage where they brought Africans to this country to use and abuse, to use and abuse our bodies, our black bodies were worth nothing in 1619. You can go on to talk about the slave experience, enslavement of black people in the United States. You can go on to talk about American eugenics movement and align those horrendous times in US history and put the US Public Health Service CIFA study right along with that. Now, in the interest of time, again, I'm not gonna detail what you heard. I wanna point out a couple of things that I heard, just not in detail, but just in passing. I heard that Attorney Gray said he was gonna stamp out everything segregated in Alabama. And I, if you heard the list of cases, he did a lot of work to do that. There's more to be done, but he's done his part. You heard him talk about Charlie Pollard coming to him because he trusted him. And you've heard about 
Miss Everest Boys, a distorted depiction of what happened. So what I want you to do in this closing, in my closing thoughts, is think about you, the questions you'd like to raise, because you heard it from the authority, not of what you think you heard, but what he experienced. And I'm, 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 I'm so pleased and so proud that he would once again come and share his thoughts, his wisdoms, his wisdom, and his insight. So let me close by thanking Attorney Gray and allowing this time for you to ask your questions uh, so that we can really continue to flush out this tragedy so that it never happens again. And last but not least, I'm working very closely with the Voices for Our Fathers Legacy Foundation. These are the descended family members of the men who were in that horrendous so-called study. They know the truth. So between Attorney Gray and the descended family members, we can get to the truth, and we will. Again, thank you for your time. Attorney Gray, thank you for your continual commitment and dedication to destroying everything segregated. Thank you. Yeah, I'm going to um, go afternoon again. Good afternoon once again. I'm going to take uh, executive privilege and, and ask the first question. And um, I see Attorney Gray, you're holding up that wonderful book. And I, I want to say something about that just before you, 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 you say something about it because it's extremely important. But I will ask the first question. Um, uh, I just uh, finished and uh, Dr. and I just finished putting together a chapter for a book for the CDC on narrative pu public ethics in which we use Mr. Pollard and Mr. Shaw it, as the as the narrative models, as literal metaphors for the 623 men, as we, we put them in conversation with Dr. John Cutler, uh, less of a conversation and more of a combat, but with Dr. John Cutler, who was the chief, the, the chief of venereal disease, and, and he wanted anybody else to be more vocal, I, even after the so-called study was over, to kind of maintain that it was in, in, in um, it was an ethical um, act and that was being done. So um, we gave great objection to it to his to his claim that it was ethical. We gave great objection to those who say it was not nefarious, that it was not evil. We say we say we called it up for what it is. In the in in the research for that. Um, the person, the, the humility of Charlie Pollard was striking, and the the uh, how articulate Herman Shaw was was also striking. As Herman Shaw said several times in the Senate hearings that was led by Senator Kennedy, Edward Kennedy. He said the Senator Kennedy would ask him, well, "Well, what did they do? Did they give you any treatment?" He said, "They gave me a pat on the back," and he said this over and over and over again. And then he, in his apology, like you said, um, Attorney Gray, he said, we were not dancing boys. We were grown men. We were not guinea hogs or guinea. One piece says guinea hogs, the other piece says guinea pigs, same thing. He said, we're not guinea pigs, but that's how we were used. So, um, Attorney Gray, the question that I have for you and Dr. Warren to reflect upon this, I want you to reflect upon the dehumanization part of of the the men that is um since you had since you had a little face to face conversation with these men who are now going on you and I, I just put into the chat box that you represent the last of a symbol of an icon who connects us to that past and that that making that past still present T.S. Eliot said there's always a past in the present, and you represent that right now. You are past and present at the same time. So the question I put to you, um, Attorney Gray, is, is can you tell us something more of the humanity, of the inhumanity, the, 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 the kinds of conversations you, would ha you had with Mr. Shaw and Mr. Pollard about how they felt about how they were used. That's the first part of the question. The second part of the question, Attorney Gray, is 
is um, what impact or help did the Senate hearings have that is led by Edward Kennedy? Uh, what impact did the Senate hearings have on your case? Was there a positive impact? Did it bring it out uh, more pur purposefully? So can you share something about the Senate hearings, number two, and number one, the feeling of the men? How did they actually feel viscerally at the gut level about what will happen to them? I took four men from the Tuskegee Syphilis to Senator, Senators, Senator Kennedy's uh, Subcommittee on Health. He was in the process of uh, preparing legislation which would prevent what happened in the Tuskegee Syphilis study in happening again. There has always been some question about, well, what about the doctors and these people who knew about these things? But there was nothing on the books at the time that would criminally, that would prevent the government from doing what it did. And as a result of those four men uh, going up to Washington and testifying, and you all probably know more about this than I do, there is now on the book some laws which requires that in order to use people in medical research, they have to have their informed consent and other details on it. What you have to remember is that lawyers, once they get cases resolved, they don't go back to try to connect all the dots up between what happened then and what happens now. Now I can understand uh, family people doing it because they, they want to know. But once a lawyer does what he has been retained to do in a matter, uh, this lawyer has probably done a lot more because it has carried on some other problems and other areas that I was working on. So I think it's good that people do it but it doesn't have to be the lawyers, the ones that are involved. And I tell people all the time in the civil rights movement, and you see a lot of lawyers do a lot of different things, but they used to tell me, they said, you supposed to be a civil rights lawyer. I didn't see you out there marching. I said, no, the only time I marched was ceremonially marched. I arranged it so other people could have the opportunity to do it. Lawyers do the legal part, let other people and you, you people in healthcare field, you do that and you uh, not you uh, dot the I's and T's and put it all together and we'll all work together. And by us, none of us trying to do all of it, we all just do one little piece. And even when we all do that, it still is a struggle. Okay, can you say something now about the, the Mr. Thank you very much for that response. Can you say something more about the, the, the human side, the emotions? How did Mr. Shaw, how did Mr. Pollard feel um, about on a gut level? How did they feel about being used in that way? Well, I think, and of course, it's, it's hard for me to tell you how they felt, but I think if you look at and in my book on Tuskegee Syphilis Study, you have, you have a copy of the speech that Mr. Shaw made. And it gives you some of his feelings. And uh, I'm sure those of you who had an opportunity of speaking to Mr. Pollard, the same thing was true. Uh, if you notice early on, Mr. Pollard was the key person that was involved. During the apology times, it was Mr. Shaw because they were playing different roles. I had to have a person prepared so that he could make a good speech at the White House in introducing the president. And I realized, and Mr. Pollard realized that uh, 
he was not the best of the ones we had. We found that Shaw, Herman Shaw was, and we had him prepared. And if you read his, his speech, I think it will answer that. But all of these, and what I tried to get people to do is that these were men, they weren't boys, they weren't shuffling Sam's in nightclubs, they were outstanding persons in their community and they played not only a role in helping health care for the nation, but they also played a role as good husbands and parents and family members and good citizens in the community. Thank you, thank you. Dr. Yes. Uh, Attorney Gray is talking about the Institutional Review Boards and you cannot do research in the federal government or federally sponsored research without clearing your research through the Institutional Review Boards. That was a direct result of the contributions of the men who were in that study. That's the first point. The second point, I was in Washington at the White House in 1997, and Mr. Shaw was the speaker, regardless of uh, the president or the vice president or the Surgeon General, Mr. Shaw took the show. He had us in tears at that event. It was the proudest day of my life. Very good. And I think if you really get to know these individuals and the relatives who are living are in a little better position than many of us because they know more about them because most of us saw them on a very limited basis. But I think you'll find that they were great men. And that's why when we got those pictures at the center and we still have it, we're still in the process of trying to identify some of those men. We have nice pictures of them, but we don't know who they are. Thank you so much for that. Um, I'm gonna get right into these questions. We have a few outstanding questions here. The first one is from Chloe Adams White and she asks, was it hard or scary for you to go against the government? What's the question now? Um, was it hard or scary for you to go against the government? Was it hard? Or scary, yes. Or scary, was it hard or scary to go against the government? Well, of course, anytime you have a lawsuit against the government, it's, it's difficult. I was trying to remember there was a, 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 a law partner of mine, Solomon Say, for a long time. He used to say it almost, he was almost afraid whenever he looks up and says, now comes the United States of America. <laughs> when you have a whole United States of America against you, that's something. <laughs> and it's, uh, it is a powerful uh, metaphor uh, because it's a big government. And if the whole government <laughs> is filing a case against you, an individual, you almost, it's almost an impossible to, to compete. Thank you. Um, we have another question asking, can you give again your stance on um, Miss Evers Boys? My staff on what? Miss Evers Boys, the movie, how you felt about it? Oh, I, I thought I'd answer that. I, oh, I, you did. I think but Ms. The... Evers Boys, while I was critical of some of the things done in it, it served a useful purpose. And I said this in uh, Tuskegee Zivli study, in that it kept the story alive and in the press. You see, because at certain points in time, nothing hardly was going on and nobody knew what was going on. But when Ms. Evers Boys came out in 1972, that gave us a, a new whole impetus. It gave them an impetus to want to get involved in and get in connection with the apology. That whole apology sets up a whole new set of circumstances and made a lot of funds available to do a lot of things that otherwise would not have happened. And part of that is because of the notoriety given by the play, Ms. Elvis Boys. So you have to take lemon and make lemonade out of it. 
Thank you. I have another question from David Anderson and he asks, um, where did the research subjects become patients after the study ended? What is it, what? Where did the research subjects become patients after the syphilis study ended? I'm not sure I followed your question. Um, and it's not you, as I have a hearing problem. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Um, the research subjects of the Tuskegee syphilis study, where did they become patients after the study ended? I'm still not following exactly what you're asking. I'm sorry. Um, I think so they, the they had individual uh, physician and healthcare providers uh, that so they didn't go to one place for care. They went to their wherever they, their regular source of care was. And uh, CDC uh, took care of that care uh, in terms of uh, 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 paying for it. Are you, are you asking about the fear that patients may have now to go to their own doctors? Um, that would be a good question too, but we're asking where they went after the study ended. I'm just sorry, I can't, uh, I'm not following. That's okay. Um, Dr. Warren answered it um, very well. We have another question from the same um, person, David Anderson. How did the National Center for Bioethics and Research and Healthcare, how were they involved in the RIBs at the community where the clinical studies uh, were being conducted? You have to ask Dr. Warren about that. I can't <laughs> tell you what the, what the Bioethics Center has done. Yeah, yeah, this is for done, Dr. Warren, think, sorry. Uh, a little the little that I know, and you see, I lawyers just deal with legal cases that's come before them. They don't deal with these other things that come about, but I'm sure that he'll be able to tell you the role that the Bioethics uh, Association has played, and it has played a very important role, and still playing an important role. Thank you, sir. The uh, IRB uh, Institutional Review Boards are separate and apart from the National Center for Bioethics and Research in Healthcare, separate entity. And every institution, university has to establish an IRB. So it's not a direct um, a relationship between IRBs and the National Center for Bioethics and Research in Healthcare. When we engage in research, we have to submit an application for IRB approval as well. Thank you. Um, I have another, it's not so much a question, but Garrett Anderson um, says to attorney Gray that you're an inspiration and thank you for your service and sharing what you did. Um, and he says, we're all better because of your commitment and we stand on your shoulders. So that's a compliment from Garrett Anderson to um, attorney Gray. Thank you very much. Um, another question from David Anderson, he says, have the tissues of the unconsented research subjects been returned or are they stored in an undisclosed federal warehouse? That's what now? Um, the tissues of the research subjects, have they been returned or um, are they stored in a federal warehouse? The pitches? Um, the research subjects, where are their tissues stored? Oh. The, the official record center, I think, is over in the, uh, uh, what's the, the health center over in Atlanta, is where Jesus. I understand most of those records are. See, the, the, I, I haven't had any need for those records once they get there. The only way and the only reason the lawyer needs the records would be during the time he needs them for the lawsuit. And once we sell the lawsuit, and that was settled some four or five years after it was filed, uh, but the matter of preserving records, and since this uh, is a significant history, those courts also save records. It, it, I think I have two responses. One. Uh, the, the records are at are housed by CDC. And the next speaker, uh, Dr. Regan Zero, has spent intentional time going through those records to really get an idea of what actually happened. Right. Now, the other part of that question was about the biospecimens or the tissues. 
Yes. The the the, the bow specimens we can't find them. Uh, the the family descended family members have asked both CDC and NIH through the Freedom of Information Act, where are those bow specimens? They have yet to get them. So that's still something we have to pursue. Well, you because know, we don't we know. We find the records when we were trying during the discovery period. <laughs> and it was uh, Jim Jones, a medical historian who wrote a book on bad blood, called me one day and told me where the records were stored in about 180 some different boxes in the National Archives. And uh, it was that phone call from him that really helped us settle the lawsuit because then we were able to find the records that the government said, we know we had them, but we don't know where they are. And they're saying the same thing about the biospecimens. Okay, that's very interesting, thank you. Um, I have another question from David Anderson. The funds for the descendants of um, the research subjects, are they, have they been ma maintained? I didn't get that. Um, the funds for the descendants, have they been maintained or redirected? You're talking about records? Um, no, the funds for the descendants of the patients. Well, the funds? Uh, yes, sir. Funds have always been in court. I don't deal with the funds. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, the funds for the health care for the descendants, would you know if they're still being maintained? No, what I'm saying is that years and years ago, we assisted the court in helping to identify individuals. But the matter of the funds and where they are and how they are dispersed has always been done through the court. And it's still done through the court if it's gonna be done at all. Um, we have another question from Jarvis Williams. Um, do you know what role black medical doctors played in the study? Do I know what, what, what black doctors played in what? Uh, the role black doctors played during the study. I, are you talking about the government doctors? Or are you talking about private individuals? Because I don't know who the government employed and who may be assigned to any part of the study. We only knew about three or four people. And as lawyers, all we would need to do would know enough people initially and to find their role and whether we felt that their roles were sufficient enough that that doctor himself should be uh, added as a part of defender. And we did have such persons added as part of defendants, those who we saw uh, and believe uh, were responsible. I have a question. Uh, Attorney Gray, you said that you lived in Tuskegee um, and you from Montgomery, Alabama, and during the whole time between 1932 and 1972, for 40 years, this study was going on and you said you, you were there, but you didn't know anything about it. And um, I, I find it also interesting that Martin Luther King, who passed it at Montgomery, lived in Atlanta, drove back and forth to his daddy's church in Atlanta, and he appeared to have not known anything about it. I'm interested in how is it possible, and um, journal articles were written at that time, how was it possible, do you know, that this could have been hidden in plain sight for 40 years, that um, these men, given the title, as Dr. Warren uh, pointed out, of untreated syphilis in the Negro male. So given the title, given the fact that it was published in journals, given the fact that you lived in the city, given the fact that Martin Luther King was driving back and forth passing Tuskegee um, uh, and, and driving through Macon County, um, how do you give an account? What do you think about the how well it was hidden in plain sight? 
I think what you have to realize is that the matter of the study and treatment of syphilis is a highly specialized field. The average person doesn't know anything about, uh, about syphilis. Why would Dr. King, who's a minister, not a doctor, not in the medical field, why would he necessarily know anything about it? Now, I did not say, and if you would read what we wrote in the book, syphilis, this study was known and there were publications about it for people who were interested in syphilis and who studied it. They knew that there was a, a study dealing with the treatment of syphilis, a lack of it. They didn't say lack of it, but it should have been the treatment of uh, syphilis in the Negro male. And there were any number of publications that came out on it. So people who were interested in knowing about the treatment of syphilis knew about the study. But that does not mean the public generally knows about it. Okay, I have a legal question. Or that they would necessarily need to know about it. There are probably okay, I, right now going on a lot of things in the medical field <laughs> that we that don't, we know, don't know anything about. <laughs> and I, I it come out unless it ends up being some real bad <laughs> and they get right. exposed like this is. So what we try to do is to make all of these things so that everybody's supposed to know everything about it. And it just doesn't happen that way. I have a legal question. Just a second, Dr. Warren, a follow-up legal question. The legal question I have is I'm concerned, I am very concerned with congenital syphilis. So I have so many students at Tuskegee University who are descendants of the men in the syphilis study. We met a gentleman um, the other day who was one of the men, oh, he, came, he came later, but he was a, one of the syphilitic men in the study. The question that I have is, is, is it possible to bring a lawsuit for those who have, who, who inherited through the DNA congenital syphilis, is it possible for the descendant family members to bring a lawsuit for harms done to them? Well, if you can find a lawyer who would do it, uh, <laughs> lawyers don't usually just go around filing lawsuits with nobody to finance them. It is tremendously important to finance lawsuits. And unless they come up, what theory are they gonna have? And how are you gonna prove it? And how is it gonna relate back to what you are saying that this person who you are suing did? Okay. Uh -huh. Thank you. Um, Just like any other lawsuit you file, you have to, it, it takes more than just saying that I'm an heir to a person who had syphilis, who may have been involved in a Tuskegee syphilis study. Therefore, I ought to have a cause of action against the government. And I just told you that you can only sue the government in conditions when they tell you. <laughs> and I don't think they have set out such a situation that, that would obligated them to pay anything. And the reason you probably haven't had any file, because there are a lot of lawyers out here who'd be happy to file cases on a contingent fee basis if there seems to be a reasonable basis for it. But everybody who thinks they have a cause of action think they have a good case. I don't care how poor it is. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. We do have another comment from Joyce Christian. Um, and she just wants to say thank you, Attorney Gray, for being so dedicated to fighting social justice all these years. That's from Joyce Christian. Um, another comment from Kayla Lloyd. She just wanted to say it's mind blowing to fathom how people were able to get away with doing something so unethical for something so long. So, well, of course, uh, you you unethical. All those things. There are certain standards. I don't know what the standards are in the medical profession, 
and you just have to get somebody else who is more knowledgeable than me. And I'm not one of those persons who try to be knowledgeable about everything. <laughs> That's right. I only deal with, and if you notice, I have pretty much kept my comments to my field, and my field is the legal profession. I don't mind answering those, but for me to try to answer, and I get people who call me every day, uh, who, I had a lady who called me just two days ago, whose great grandfather, somebody was born in 1932, and she wanted to tell me that that person was a participant in what is now the Tuskegee Civil Study. And I said, Madam, it may be, but it's not the one that I learned for the facts in these people case. In 32, you'd be a, a baby. And all the persons involved in the study at least were grown. But when people want some money, They'll try to get it almost any way they can get it. Absolutely. And it's unfortunate. I did have one more question of my own that you touched upon earlier. Um, in your personal opinion, do you think that there is a correlation between the fear um, the Black community has with the medical field and um, the Tuskegee syphilis study? Let me see. Let me try to get that again. I'm sorry. Um, as you mentioned earlier, the fear um, that the Black community has with the medical field, do you think you're, that you're is- You're talking about Black people who have some concern about trusting doctors yes. who are Black? Yes. Are you talking about the, the, the doctors being Black or are you talking about the patients being Black? Both. What difference would it make? <laughs> Just the black community and the medical field in general. Is the is is the inference that only white should be in the medical field and black should not? I'm just trying to see what's the what's behind the question. Oh no no! As you mentioned earlier, there's a fear that a lot of the black community has with the medical field. Do you think that is related to the Tuskegee syphilis experiment? Well. I may not have been, what, uh, let me say it this way. I think the last thing that these men, and I've said this before in programs, I think the last thing that these men would want to occur as a result of their being in the study is to stop all medical uh, trials or whatever you, the proper name for it, because if you're gonna do away with some of these diseases, you need to have persons who are willing to participate in proper studies, but they need to have proper rules and regulations and guidelines and they should be followed. And I think they would not want you not to be involved in a study because of them if the study is properly conducted with proper guidelines. And if I said anything to the contrary to that, that's what I, uh, I believe. Thank you. Um, starting with Attorney Gray, do you have any closing remarks? Oh, uh, Sierra, I just have one final okay, question. Okay, go ahead, I'm sorry. Uh, and this question is directed towards uh, Attorney Gray. With the case that you have uh, that you filed and with all other instances that have been going on within the United States, do you think that African Americans in the United States have a case to actually bring to the United Nations about the mistreatment of Black people in America? Was that a question for me? Yes. I didn't get it, I'm sorry. Okay, um, with, with your case, with the USPHS syphilis study and everything that has happened since then with Flint, with police brutality, 
do you, in your legal uh, per, uh, advice, do you think that uh, African Americans have a case for the for the United Nations to bring against uh, the United States for the mistreatment of Black people? Do I think they have a cause of action to bring against somebody? Against the uh, against the United States to the world well, court. The you would United have States. to find a act, or find an act that authorized them to file such a suit. And unless you can find a statute which makes the federal government liable for the injury you're talking about, you're not gonna be able to sue the federal government. And that's for any cause of action. Thank you so much for that question, Shanti Ali. Um, I do wanna ask if um, Dr. Warren or Attorney Gray have any closing remarks. We can start with you, Mr. Gray. Do you have any closing remarks? Oh, well, let me uh, just again, thank you for the invitation. I appreciate it. And uh, I appreciate all the work that everybody's doing in the healthcare field. We certainly need more of it. And I think uh, among the disparities that exist between whites and black healthcare is one of those. So we certainly need to do everything we can to improve healthcare among all the people and particularly among African-Americans. And thank you. Thank you. Dr. Warren. Again, a unique opportunity to hear uh, from someone uh, about what actually happened. And so I think this is not in, it's not in the book, except in his book, as you can see, I have. But more importantly, you can have the kind of interchange, the kind of conversation that um, we've had today. And I, again, I'm so honored to, to have him share his thoughts with us. And thank you for a job well done as moderator. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hey, uh, we want to thank Sierra Seiler for, um, for, for coming back to Tuskegee University. Ma Tuskegee, you know, the fact that you graduated, you still belong to us. That's why it's called Alma Mater. Right, so we thank you, um, Ms. Siler, for coming back for doing such a wonderful job. Give your, be your uh, our best regards to your mom and dad. And uh, when I'm in Cleveland, um, they, they 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 should feed me. Amen. All right, um, <laughs> um, uh, Attorney Gray, um, uh, Ms. Siler is from Cleveland, and when I was giving a talk at Case Western University at your alma mater, um, her, both of her parents were there and her and she was there so she is uh, um so so you're familiar with her you, you're familiar with with, with her home so uh we want to thank you um attorney gray not just for presenting today but for the work that you have done through for for 66 years as an attorney you've been an attorney longer than i've been alive and you started as an attorney when i was like six years old i mean 11 years i was a baby so we want to thank you for the